Okay. Preparing live stream. One moment, please. Take a long time. Okay. And cool. We're up. Um, well, great. Welcome back, everyone, for another uh, guest artist talk. Today we have Alex Temple with us. Um, Alex uh, writes music that distorts and combines iconic sounds to create new meanings, often in service of surreal, cryptic, or fantastical stories. In addition to performing her own works for voice and electronics, she has collaborated with performers and ensembles such as Melissa Hughes, Julia Holter, Wild Up, Spectral Quartet, and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Um, she recently completed a DMA at Northwestern University and is now an assistant professor of composition at Arizona State University. Without further ado, Alex, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me here. All right, so we're going to talk about polystylism. So I want to start off by asking you all, how many of you are familiar with this term? Uh, and does anybody want to offer a definition? Feel free to just unmute and say a thing. Polystylism is the juxtaposition of different styles or genres within a piece or a short period of time or against each other at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And um, in particular, it's uh, the juxtaposition of different styles with the intent that they be heard in, contra in contrast to each other. Um, because there's lots of music in the world that combines different styles but integrates them very smoothly. And polystylism is characterized by uh, the cut from one to another, uh, as well as various other modes of combining them. Uh, so the term polystylism was coined by the Russian composer Alfred Schnitke in around 1970. I see in the chat we said we have Poulenc. Yeah, I think Poulenc is a very important antecedent there. Uh, in particular, uh, I've thought a lot about his double piano concerto uh, in connection with the concept of polystylism. And I'll bring that up in a minute because there's a reception history fact about that piece uh, that I wrote a paper about once. But sticking with Schnitke for now, uh, I just want to launch in and listen to some music. So let's listen to a movement from his first Concerto Grosso written in 1977. 
Then it goes straight into the next movement. Does anybody else hear some sort of strange sound in the background? What is that? I think, yeah, I think that's uh, Julian on his walk. Uh, I think. He oh, is okay. Needed. Okay. Uh, so my first question to you is: What specifically are the styles uh, that just that? Shostakovich, because that's a reference point that Schnitke is uh, alluding to or stylistically quoting in this movement. Shall I go or okay? Yeah, anybody who has anything to say, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say tango. I mean, it already says it's a concerto grosso. Um, yeah, and then all of that, all of that chromaticism that kind of really comes to a head at the end. Yeah, so yeah, we've got the tango. Uh, we've got the Baroque Italian style music, which is alluded to, of course, by the title Concerto Grosso. Uh, and there's this dissonant chromatic music, uh, some of which is very much in a kind of shostakovich -y, bartok -y modernism kind of vein, which is why I said Shostakovich by accident earlier. Um, and some of which is more clustery and post-1960. I would add also that the violin solo parts are often sound more like something out of a 19th century violin concerto uh, than something out from a Baroque concerto grosso. But in addition to juxtaposing and combining these styles, Schnitke also distorts them. So for example, at the very beginning, just pull up some audio here. Right here at the beginning. Just in that passage, as each of these notes uh, comes in, it's a sequence. You've got sol, fa, me, and re, and the sol is held against the fa and the fa is held against the soul and so on. So that there are multiple harmonies happening simultaneously. Whereas in an actual Baroque piece, they would be separated from each other. Uh, another technique that he uses frequently in this movement is chromatic canons. So for example, here, uh, I'll just play an excerpt from rehearsal four. in this passage. So all the lower strings there are just uh, each coming in with the same 16th note figure, but they're all a uh, minor ninth apart from the previous one. So what had been a tonal figure is turned into the source of a big clustery chromatic kind of harmony. Another example is at rehearsal 16 when he does something similar to the tango material. So on. So here, the whoa, falling over computer. That is happening. First of all, each group of strings, uh, violin ones come in playing that in parallel diminished seventh chords, which completely obviates its harmonic function, right? And then the next group, violins two, come in with the same thing in a different parallel set of parallel diminished seventh chords a half step lower and a quarter note later. Then the violas come in again and there are yet another half step lower and a quarter note later. So you get this massive blobby texture out of what had been a pretty straightforward tango melody. <laughs> 
And then finally, there's maybe the most obvious moment is when there's a 5-1 cadence in the tango, except the one chord is replaced by a cluster in the harpsichord, where I saw a lot of people smiling. So these distortion techniques uh, complicate the idea of polystylism. It's not just taking styles and putting them next to each other, but also modifying them in ways that bring them into relation with each other uh, and perhaps suggest a way of that we can relate to this material in the present, in the specific cultural context that the piece was written in, in this case, the USSR in the 70s. So one of the things I wanna ask is, what does Schnitka's attitude towards the materials he's using seem to be here? When you heard this, kind what did of you take to be? Yeah, oh, sorry, like say that again? Irreverent? Irreverent, yeah. But like, I don't know if I would wanna go as far as to say that he's parodying them because I feel like that like kind of implies like an intention that I have no way of knowing. Fair. This is interesting to me because I, um, let's cycle back to Poulenc for a minute. I'm the one who brought him up. When, when, yeah. I, when I hear Poulenc's juxtapositions, I hear irreverence. Listening to Schnitke, I'm not, I'm not sure. I feel like maybe later that's a way of showing reverence or appreciation. I, I don't know. I feel like we're guessing and that our answer to this question is a subjective one. But um, my, my, my colleague, uh, Dale, I just, I heard it differently. Yeah, it certainly is subjective. Uh, but I think you can also point to specific musical techniques that might suggest a particular orientation toward the music. Uh, so for example, and this is also subjective to a degree, when we get to that moment where the 5-1 cadence is interrupted by a cluster, I think almost everybody here heard that as humorous. Uh, and one possible interpretation of that is that it's taking the wind out of the tango's sails. So you're not allowed to experience the resolution that you would normally have in that genre. Any other thoughts, subjective or otherwise, uh, as to what you heard the attitude towards the music being? Well, one thing that I just stuck in the comments is um, what's interesting is how the held notes are creating almost like a reverb type effect in addition to just being a chromatic effect. So that's almost like he's messing with the acoustics of how we're perceiving it in addition to just distorting it in chromatic ways. I think that's a great point, yeah. It suggests the influence of studio produced music perhaps. Or other movements like spectralism. Or spectralism, yeah, for sure. And I don't know what Schnitke had access to uh, in Russia at the time. Uh, there was, I know that when he was younger, there were there was a lot of uh, underground experimental rock culture that he was sort of tangentially involved in. And his first symphony, which is an earlier piece, has uh, electric guitars and such in it. It was somewhat actually somewhat unusual for him to make reference directly to contemporary pop culture, but he does do it occasionally. And here's the thing. We do have access to some information about how Schnitke felt about the materials he was using because he wrote about it. And to my mind, what he says doesn't really sound as liberatory as I would ideally like polystylism to be. When he talks about the materials he's using here, there's still an implicit aesthetic hierarchy. So for example, one of the uh, phrases he uses to describe this movement, this, this piece is symbols of Baroque music, freely tonal chromaticisms and vulgar functional music of a particularly banal stamp, which doesn't make it sound like he has much respect for the tango or the Vivaldi-esque gestures that he's using. He also references the Baroque elements of this piece as being guaranteed as genuine Corelli made in the USSR. Kind of a sarcastic description. Does knowing that change how you hear the piece in retrospect? I mean, I, I feel like I can hear an element of the sarcasm within how he's treated the material perhaps. 
So maybe. Yeah, there's kind of the dissonance has a certain acerbic quality, which also uh, recalls Shostakovich, who is, uh, as I said, a pretty obvious and audible influence on Schnitke. Hmm. I hate to bring up this word so early on, but um, <laughs> appropriation is kind of how uh, comes to mind when it comes to how he treats it, because he's bringing in these styles, but he's not give he's not acknowledging the context, but completely obliterating it by um, working through them in such a rhapsodic way. And so that to me does come off with the irreverence um, that uh, his writings seem to reflect. Yeah, uh, there is an obliteration of context, but there's also in a certain sense a reliance on context, right? Because if you've never heard a Baroque concerto grosso, and if you've never heard a tango, you would not necessarily, you'd hear, you know, there's a contrast of harmonic language, but you wouldn't have the same associations with this music that probably everybody did. I think there's a certain ambiguity or ambivalence in Schnitke's music. And to me, it makes me think of something that Umberto Eco once wrote uh, in the postscript to the name of the rose. He makes a very striking remark about what he calls the postmodern condition. Uh, background, necessary background for this. Does everybody know who Barbara Cartland is? She's a prolific romance novelist of the late 20th century who, uh, you know, serious literature people are supposed to look down on. And Umberto Eco says the following. I think of the postmodern attitude as that of a man who loves a very cultivated woman and knows that he cannot say to her, I love you madly, because he knows that she knows and she knows he knows that these words have already been written by Barbara Cartland. Still, there is a solution. He can say, as Barbara Cartland would put it, I love you madly. At this point, having avoided false innocence, having said clearly that it is no longer possible to speak innocently, he will nevertheless have said what he wanted to say to the woman, that he loves her in an age of lost innocence. This point of view is, seems very old fashioned in many ways now to me, uh, aside from the whole, you know, assumption of heteronormativity and all that, it's, there's an implicit aesthetic hierarchy. You know, it describes the woman as cultivated and you're supposed to just understand that saying something that Barbara Cartland said is a terrible, you know, dark mark on your cultural cred. Uh, and yet that's the world Schnitka grew up in. He was born in 1934 and he's of that generation, same generation as Echo. And for him, Maybe you can't say this tango. Maybe you can only say, as a tango would say, this tango. The other question that comes to mind that I wanna ask you about is Poulenc, which we mentioned, there are other antecedents you can think of to polystylism. Charles Ives is an obvious example, Mahler. I think especially of the slow movement of the Mahler First Symphony which starts as a funeral march based on a minor mode canon version of Frere Jacques or Bruder Martin, the German version, which then turns into a sort of klezmer music, suggesting perhaps walking around the streets of Vienna and passing a uh, funeral and then passing some Jewish street musicians and so on. But there's a lot more of this starting in the late 60s. You can draw it all the way back to medieval motets that incorporated uh, street street songs, street vendor songs. But there's a lot more of it starting in the late 60s. And not just in the contemporary classical world either. You have the sudden uh, emergence of jazz fusion and of psychedelic rock albums with tape collages on them and so on. Why do you think it might be that there's so much more of this starting at that time? Why was that the cultural moment? Recording technology made all these things available and immediate. Absolutely, yeah. Anything else? See in the chat, globalization? Yeah, for sure. And those two things in interaction with each other, where not only do you suddenly have access through recording 
to all kinds of music from your own culture, but also from other cultures around the world. Schnitke himself uh, described this as the polyphonization of human consciousness. Uh, and when I say he refers to the jumble of sounds that reaches us daily from radio and television through open windows and cites just the mere existence of words like split screen and multimedia as evidence of a new development in society in the 1970s. Anything else? Any other reasons come to mind? I think also just sort of the anti-establishment culture that was sort of blossoming in that era in, in the United States, especially. Absolutely, yeah. There's a sense of the old order breaking down. And Schnitka occupies this sort of strange position because you know he was somebody who was born in the 30s. He wasn't a young counterculture kid. And he clearly felt that old notions of purity of style and uh, maximum order that you get in a lot of modernism in the 50s and 60s and that and sharp separation between pop culture and formal culture. He clearly felt that those things were obsolete, but at the same time, he couldn't shake the aesthetic hierarchies that he had grown up with. Uh, so that there's a really sort of equivocal character there. Now, I wanna contrast that to another composer who was about 20 years younger and whose music deals with polystylism in a very different way. And that is John Zorn. I'll read you a quote from an interview with him that gives you a pretty clear idea of Zorn's attitude. He says, this is something I really react strongly against, the idea of high art and low art. I mean, that distinction's a bunch of fucking bullshit. There's good music and great music and phony music in every genre, and all the genres are the fucking same. So this is how you deal with polystylism if you uh, hang out in the downtown New York scene rather than in the Russian uh, contemporary classical scene. So I want to listen to maybe five or six minutes from the beginning of his piece Spillane from 1987. And then I'll ask you what the styles being referenced are again, uh, and how it differs from Schnitke's use of polystylism. So keep those in mind as we listen. And I do want to warn you, this track begins with a blood curdling scream. So uh, don't let that take you by surprise. Here we go. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
the smoke. it there because it just is one continuous thing that's about six and a half minutes out of 22 or so uh, it's a large scale piece so let me ask you again what styles do you hear in this go ahead hear a lot of like early rock, um, various forms of jazz, like some film noir stuff going on, uh, a little bit yeah. of noise. Yeah, so yeah, there's kind of some rockabilly stuff. Uh, there's bebop for sure, uh, kind of this mid-tempo finger snapping jazz, sounds like something out of Twin Peaks, which hadn't come out yet, but it was in the air. Or uh, um, musique concrète. Even. Definitely musique concrète for yeah. sure. Yeah, Dale, tell me more about what you mean by film noir stuff. I think that's a, a striking comment. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of, like, this, the, like, recorded, like, tape stuff, which is, I'm, I'm assuming that's what it was, like, it didn't strike me as, like, oh, this reminds me of a specific musical idiom. It, it was more like, oh, this is, like, the, the like, hard-boiled, grayscale uh, detective who smokes too much, and he, like speaks in like really cheesy like i'm so grizzled and like that kind of a thing <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and the piece is named after mickey spillane who was a crime writer in the 1940s uh, who was known for his novels being more sexual and violent than a lot of other hard-boiled writers in the period uh, 
Uh, the New Republic actually called him, quote, a dangerous, paranoid sadist and masochist, to which he responded, you can sell a lot more peanuts than caviar. So that's Mickey Spillane. The spoken word passages are supposed to be his detective protagonist, Mike Hammer. So yeah, cheesy for sure. I thought the rain moment was pretty cool though, when it was talking about rain and there was the windshield wiper sound, which took me like a good moment to figure out what that was. And then it starts talking about rain and I'm like, oh, I see what this is. Yeah, so there's a sense in which you've got these Foley effects, which imitate not existing music, but some aspect of the, of the real world and its sounds, which are then given context by spoken narration, which already places this in a very different uh, mode than Schnitke, uh, in that you have words to deal with, words and also real world sounds. Yeah. Some other things we could mention, well, Dale, you said noise. Uh, there's some stuff that sounds like sort of gothic horror movie soundtrack music toward the end of the clip that I played with the tubular bells and the synth strings and so on. There's some kind of outer space sound effects. Uh, there's uh, blues section and so on. So it's a very different set of styles than Schnitke is working with and also a lot more of them. Do you think that Zorn's more democratic approach towards style is audible here? Without knowing about the two composers and what they said about their music, would you guess, would you surmise, would you get the impression that Zorn has a less hierarchical and more democratizing attitude towards style and why? What musical features are giving you that impression? I would say yes. Um, and I was trying to figure out this out because my first reaction to this was, it seemed like it was telling a story, but I didn't know what the details of the story were. But I think that kind of speaks to the form and structure and use of uh, the styles because it, he kind of returns to um, certain styles. And I can't say in specifics, I can't remember, but returns to styles in a more structured way. Whereas Schnick was kind of just like, I have this motive that is you know, classical, and you're going to hear it in all these styles. And it was more Fantasia-like than this was kind of more. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Schnitke, that almost that whole piece is just do-do-do-do. I mean, that whole movement or do-do-do-do-do-do-do. It's just those two motifs. And here they are as Shostakovich, and here they are as my grandma's favorite tango, which he actually says in his description of the piece. Uh, and here they are as a concerto grosso, and here they are as a big chromatic cluster uh situation. There's no real common motivic material in Zorn Spillane. The beginning does come back at the very end, but other than that, uh, it's much more separated out into sections. And what, what gives it coherence is not a motif, but a concept, a topic, uh, a set of images. I guess going, else, off, yeah. going off of what Dewey just said, um, related but um i feel like the sections with styles what schnitka said about kind of having them be this is it this way this is it that way like the styles are sort of much more separated and in the zorn they blend together more and you get like a bluesy passage and then all these recorded sounds on top of it and then it goes to like a spoken thing that happens on top of all of that which then everything else fades out and it yeah, so it's more dynamic in that sense. Yeah, there's definitely a layering effect that you get here that you don't get as much in the Schnitka. Although Schnitka does eventually place those different motifs on top of each other. Uh, it feels more like, you know, here's some polyphony. Right, but you're not like getting the tango and the concerto grosso happening at the same time, for instance. Right, yeah. The closest you get is that on top of the tango, you know, you have and then the violin solos are going and they're still using that motif, but it no longer sounds Baroque. Whereas here, yeah, um, there's especially the tape effects and the Foley effects are often layered on top of other things. Uh, where you simultaneously have something suggesting a musical style happening at the same time as something suggesting a particular uh, real world scenario. Yeah, 
I would add on top of that, the styles are much less distorted here. They're layered, but they're not, you know, put through the ringer of experimentalism in the same sense. When there's a mid-tempo blues, it's just a mid-tempo blues. It's not a mid-tempo blues, but the one chord is replaced with a cluster and, uh, you know, the guitar is replaced with a harpsichord or whatever. And that's partially because Zorn himself is also a jazz musician and has, has done a ton of improvisation. Uh, and also because this album was a collaborative studio effort with a bunch of downtown New York avant-garde jazz musicians, including John Lurie, Anthony Coleman, Bill Frizzell, and so on. So John Zorn's actual life is less genre segregated than Schnitke's. Uh, he's an improviser, he's a contemporary classical composer, he's been in a bunch of rock bands, um, including uh, Naked City, which uh, is known for extreme quick change uh, genre juxtapositions. Uh, sometimes, you know, each style only lasting for a couple of seconds. So by leaving the styles more undistorted, uh, he's letting them speak for themselves more rather than having to channel them through, you know, here's my compositional voice and I'm going to do this thing. And also I'm kind of quoting this thing, but I'm putting in quotation marks because Barbara Cartland said it. Um, <laughs> Zorn never sounds like he's saying, you know, well, as Charlie Parker would say, bebop thing. It's just a bebop thing. Also, too, what I find yeah, go interesting, ahead. sorry, uh, what I find interesting here is um, based off of your comment of like the good, the better, and the phony or um, something like that, and just knowing uh, a lot of John Zorn's music is that he's very respectful of the various genres that he's utilizing it's and and as uh, Lara said that he's not he's there's no distortion it's just layering but he's let letting those layers breathe and be themselves mm -hmm. um and he's really not in his in his voice compositional voice is his organization of all of the various layers but it's not the way he manipulates the layers within themselves, which is, I find very interesting about his music. Yeah, I think that's true. And there are definitely passages here where you can hear his particular melodic and harmonic sensibility, particularly in the kind of like chromatic rock circus music thing. That just, it sounds like a John Zorn composition. Um, that's not really so much a genre as just a thing that he does. Uh, but then the bebop just kind of sounds like bebop. Um, and he's, you know, it sounds like John Zorn doing bebop, but it's not, uh, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's allowed to just be, to breathe, to be what it is, to be wherever you are, if anybody's a Steven Universe fan. <laughs> yeah. Going back to that issue of Foley, though, um, one of you, I think it was Dale and Lara both brought this up, this issue of having a visual image in mind. And in fact, Zorn refers to pieces like this as oral cinema. So let me put that question to you as well. In what way specifically is this like cinema? Oh, I was thinking about this. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting how it, it feels like some of, the, some of the music is diagenic and some of it is not diagenic. Yeah. And so then you get these like real world sounds coming in, playing with the music and you see, oh, or maybe somebody's like cheering the, the jazz musicians. So you're like, OK, so that's that's happening in that's diagenic. And then maybe some of this other music, like the horror movie sort of stuff is not diagenic. And that's sort of layering on top. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So for anybody who's not aware, uh, diegetic is a term from uh, the film world. Uh, which refers to something that's present in the narrative rather than a storytelling device that's outside of the narrative. So if the characters go to a rock concert, then the music in that scene is diegetic. If it's part of the score and the characters aren't aware of it, then it's non-diegetic. And plenty of movies play with this for comedic effect or disturbing effect. You know, you'll hear, uh, you know, I don't know, two characters are making out and they'll be, you know, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet. And then, and then, uh, somebody will you know, reach over and turn off the stereo and the music stops and you realize it was actually something they were actually listening to. Um, and yeah, here Zorn plays with that quite a bit. 
I think, for example, of that blues passage, it doesn't, you're not just hearing blues, you're hearing a representation of a blues club where you hear the audience and they're there and they're part of the experience. Anyone want to add to this? The cinematic so question? Sorry, I keep talking. Um, no, go for it. <laughs> no, but uh, from a more music concrete perspective, perhaps, I took an electronic music class like a few years ago in my undergrad. And um, one of the things that came up is how recognizable our sounds as such. I guess that's like the windshield wiper thing. Um, how much can you distort that bec before it becomes unrecognizable and how you can make it recognizable again by connecting it to rain? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, since you mentioned Music Concrete, I think about uh, Pierre Schaeffer's own description of the three modes of listening, which he described as causal, semantic, and reduced. So, um, Pierre Schaeffer, so if anybody's unaware, is uh, the inventor of the term music concrète uh, and one of the first people to do it. Uh, even before magnetic tape, he was doing it on wax cylinders in the 40s, which is kind of astonishing. So he talked about causal listening, which is when you're assessing the exact source of a sound that you're hearing. Uh, this is really primal because it's, it's how, part, how, part of how species survive. Uh, so in the same sense that, you know, hearing a twig snap and saying, okay, is that a leopard that's about to eat me? Uh, you're here, you're hearing, uh, in this piece, you're hearing traffic and you're hearing sirens and you're hearing people cheering and you're identifying those automatically. You don't even have to think about it as sirens and cheering and so on. Then there's the semantic mode of listening where you're assessing meaning uh, in the context of a communication system. So when you're listening to uh, Mike Hammer talking about cigarettes burning through his hand and stupid idiots and so on, uh, you're understanding those to be words, but that also means that you're hearing the sirens and you're thinking, okay, there's sirens here because this is a crime drama or sort of a fragmented non-narrative crime drama. And you're hearing people cheering and you're thinking that means they're expressing their appreciation of the music that's going on at the same time. Or you hear a warbly synth noise and you think, okay, that sounds like 1950s science fiction, or that sounds like film noir. And then finally, there's the reduced mode of listening, which Schiffer was very interested in and which is in some ways a challenge to achieve where you're assessing a sound as a thing in itself, independent of cause or meaning. Humans are wired for meaning, right? We're wired to hear things and interpret them. That's a very basic part of us. Learning to listen to sound just as sound is challenging. Uh, and Schaeffer didn't want people to completely ignore the first two meanings. You know, when he was writing uh, a music concrete etude based on railroad sounds. He wanted you to know they were railroad sounds, but he also took them and put them through processes that would bring out their sonic characteristics uh, and enable us to focus more on that. With Zorn, I think there's a similar kind of dance between multiple modes of listening, where the narrative is part of it and the imitation of real world sounds is part of it. And also the sheer sound itself is part of it. So there's a kind of play with all of those, which is itself in a way very cinematic, uh, but it's more of a sort of avant-garde cinema. You know, we have these spoken word passages, but there's no real story. They're just kind of bits of things that are suggestive of hard-boiled crime novels. Other thoughts or questions? Is the suggestiveness of the crime novel in that way um, somewhat parodying the crime novel then because it's just like I don't need to give you all this information for you to know generally what's going on and that's what gives it a sense of a story is it's working off the cliche yeah um, parody is a complicated issue as we talked about personally I don't hear it as parodying so much as abstracting how does one abstract without it edging towards parody that's a good question. And I'm happy to hear anybody else's thoughts on that too. 
I'm sort of interested in what work the abstraction is doing, um, especially if thinking of crime novels as sort of a cishet male fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, although, you know, Patricia Highsmith was one of the major crime novelists of the period, but Spillane is definitely, you know, doodly dude crime novel. Yeah, I was getting that vibe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I haven't actually read Spillane, but from everything I know about his work, um, and that's definitely what uh, what Zorn is going for here. I don't think there are any women on the, uh, on this album. Uh, uh, just a thought on the idea of like abstraction and parody and all of that. Like, whenever we talk about like narrative and music, I feel like we have a tendency to move towards like understanding that you need to abstract it in order to make it function as music. Like with opera, a lot of times you'll work. And I'm not like an expert in opera, so anybody who is, please correct me. Um, like a lot of times we'll work with stories that we already like know what's going to happen. Like that's why like we set biblical music uh, passages or ideas about like to like to oratorios and stuff like that. Like That's why we work with the, so many like very common cultural stories and myths and all of that in order to because then you know the know the story so you know what's going to happen so you can abstract it and make it into music because music is such an abstract art form so and and i don't think we ever understand that as parodying the ideas or the stories therein yeah i mean it's complicated because you know in mozart operas you certainly get references to specific musical genres and they are they do tend to be kind of absorbed into the mozart style machine and sometimes they do come off as, as paradistic particularly in comedies where a lot of what's going on has to do with class warfare, essentially. And so you get a paradistic approach both to working class music and to elite music, uh, which is something that Schnitka seems to be going with as well. Uh, and there's a, whole, there's a major tendency in the 70s to, uh, for experimental composers to have this sort of, you know, Classical music is the music of, of the bourgeois establishment. And we don't really want to do that, but we're also kind of working in that vein. So we're doing it and we're parodying at the same time. Zorn was operating in a different cultural milieu. He was playing in downtown clubs. He was playing in bands with improvisers. So in a way he's got less of a hang up about feeling like he's working in a tradition that he also takes issue with. Um, but yeah, there is this kind of bias, this notion that abstract is better than concrete in a lot of classical music culture, which ties into a whole bunch of other hierarchies that are built into the culture that we're still trying to deconstruct. Mind is better than body. Um, organic form is better than disjunct form. Uh, you could keep coming up with these. Uh, and you know the mere facts that we get mad when people cough in a concert tells you what we really think about mind and body. There's this terrible paradox of classical music, which is that on the one hand, the traditional classical music world is very disdainful of electronic music, um, particularly electronic music that plays pitches, synthesizers. So we insist that music has to be produced by means of the body, but then we have it played in venues where we're supposed to all pretend that we don't have bodies. We're just ears and brains. You know, you gotta, you don't clap except at when at the last minute, even when they're, you know, if, if between movements, when there's, uh, in fact, between pieces, you know, the performers have walked off stage or they're on stage, but they're like adjusting their music stands and stuff. Everybody whispers, why? Why do we do that? Because we're not supposed to have bodies in the concert hall. We're not supposed to cough. We're not supposed to dance, you know? I remember going to see, um, Turangalila Symphony played by the CSO. And that music makes me move. I would not in a really organized dance way, but I have a physical reaction to it. Everybody else was sitting stock still. This is not only classical music culture, it's also indie rock culture. Uh, the Dismemberment Plan in 1997 wrote a song making fun of this tendency called Do the Standing Still, which they call the brand new step that everybody isn't moving to. So, yeah, so this feeds into the notion that abstraction is better than concretion. But Zorn, I think, is also much less uh, focused in that direction than a lot of other composers. There's the sounds of bodies are all over this piece. Voices, clapping, footsteps, um, 
but they're not real bodies. They're studio constructed artificial bodies. And this is very much a product of studio recording, this piece. It was assembled in the studio. Was, I think he, maybe they did perform it live, but it wasn't really made for live performance. It was made to be listened to on a, on, you know, a turntable uh, with really nice speakers or headphones. Uh, and that in a sense makes it even more cinematic. But yeah, the fact that there isn't a coherent narrative distinguishes it from say radio drama. You could have a radio drama. There are lots of hard boiled crime radio dramas in the forties, but uh, they, you know, and they, some, they did include background music and they did include sound effects. Usually less, not so much music concrete sound effects taken from the real world as artificial studio effects. You know, if you want to, if you want somebody to sound like they're walking through snow, you take a bunch of cornstarch and you pound it with your fist. Um, but uh, it, yeah, there is a, still a certain sense that abstraction, that musicalization means abstraction. And it would be a very different piece if there were spoken word narrative running through the entire thing. It would uh, shift our focus and our attention very much toward what Schaeffer would call semantic listening and, uh, and away from uh, reduced listening. All right, so I wanna shift focus finally uh, to uh, the band Mr. Bungle, who John Zorn actually produced their first album. They were uh, formed in the 90s in Eureka, California. And uh, they have certain elements in common with Zorn's music, but they're also their own thing. And polystylism is a major part of their modus operandi. Uh, I've been a fan of them for, oh, I don't know, 20 years. And I was happy to see that they've recently got some scholarly attention from uh, Rebecca Layden in an article called Recombinant Style Topics, the Past and Future of Sampling. So Layden's approach is based on topic theory. Uh, how many of you are familiar already with topic theory? A little bit, a little bit. Okay, so topic theory uh, is a mode of analysis developed originally by Leonard Ratner to talk about classical period music, which has been since expanded to a bunch of other kinds of music. The idea behind topic theory is that music uses small gestures that are evocative of some kind of extra musical thing. Uh, Ratner describes topics as a kind of informal iconography, figures that have direct or symbolic meaning. Y.J. Allenbrook described them as gestures that vibrated in a familiar fashion in people's ears and pulses. And Kofi Agawu describes topics as enclosing functional music in quotation marks. So some of the topics that you get in 18th and 19th century music include uh, references to Viennese waltz style, hunting music in the form of imitating horn calls, you know. I think I played that in the wrong key, but that's okay. Um, that's a Scarlatti Sonata. Uh, Sturm und Drang, uh, referencing the German literary movement, uh, dance forms like gigue and minuet, mechanical clockwork style, uh, the use of dense counterpoint to suggest learnedness or esotericness, and so on. So in the song that we're about to listen to by Mr. Bungle, uh, which is called Golem II, the Bionic Vapor Boy, uh, it's from 1999, uh, here are the topics that Layden identifies. So you can listen for these while we're hearing the song. One, antique mechanical, including carnival music, which he describes as the sounds of antique music making machines. That's one. Two, retrofuturistic, 1980s digital aesthetics, Casio keyboards, talking robot sounds, random electronic blips and squawks. That's her phrasing. Three, bubblegum, 1960s pop with Farfisa organ and bouncy melodic riffs. Four, 1970s funk, particularly noting the use of electric clavichord. And five, cool jazz, represented by a shing shing a shing shing a ride symbol. Again, Layden's description. But let's listen to the song. It's about three and a half minutes. This is Mr. Bungle's Golem 2, The Bionic Vapor Boy. <laughs> 
Bungle use styles that they're referencing differently than Zorner Schnitka here? It's much more blended, I feel. Mm -hmm. What does the blending consist of? It's always remarkable to me how much a drum beat can make things cohesive. <laughs> and I think that's the most effective tool. That's definitely true. Yeah, they've got some other songs that are more uh, starkly contrasty, uh, in part because the percussion changes up uh, when the styles do. Here, it's it's yeah, there is definitely some cohesiveness given by the backbeat. But I think there's other ways in which they're blended. I feel like, and maybe this is going out on a limb, but like the way it's mixed, um, like studio production feels like it kind of creates like like an ambience or a veneer that lasts throughout the song even while other things are changing like i felt like i was in a single space throughout the entirety of that track mm. yeah i think that's an excellent point were you did the stereo separation come through well over over the zoom share because <laughs> there's the uh, panning is definitely something that Mr. Bungle uses in this song to combine things. So for example, you'll have some kind of bubblegum thing happening. And then over in the left channel, there'll also be some electronic bleeps and bloops, uh, what uh, Layden refers to as the retro, -future, retro futuristic topic. And then maybe also in the right channel, there'll be a funky clavinet part. So all of those things are happening at the same time. But they're also less complete in a way. Where Zorn, when Zorn does bebop, I mean, yeah, sure, sometimes there's just bebop drumming under some ambient sounds, but often it's just a slab of bebop. And when Schnitka does a tango, you've got, yeah, the instrumentation and harmonies are distorted, but you've got the melody and you've got the bass line and the chordal accompaniment pattern and all the elements of the tango texturally are there. Here, often it's just the clavinet part from funk or you know, just the vocal style, but vocal line from a bubblegum song. Uh, two of my favorite writers about uh, style and meaning are uh, Philip Tagg and Bob Clarida, who wrote a book called 10 Little Title Tunes, which is an analysis of Slab of Bebop, another band name, yes. <laughs> um, 10 Little Title Tunes is an analysis of TV theme music. And they talk a lot about different ways that um, it's very much like topic theory, but they use their own language for it. And one of the things they talk about is what they call a genre synecdoche. So uh, if anybody's not familiar with the term synecdoche, it's when a part represents a whole. Like if you say, get your ass in here, the ass represents the whole person. Um, or if you refer to a pair of shoes as high heels, the heels represent the entire shoe. Um, so a genre synecdoche is the use of just one element of a genre to uh, represent and bring forth and call forth in your mind an entire genre. Synecdoche, well, yeah, no, I mean, the movie Synecdoche New York is an intentional play on Schenectady and Synecdoche. Uh, and I recommend it very highly if you haven't seen it, especially if you like movies that are surreal and extremely depressing. Um, so, take this in here, Synecdoche, yeah. Um, so, there are genre synecdoches all over many, many different uh, modes of music, um, um, modes of music making. Uh, when in you know 19th century music, when there's just the accompaniment pattern from a Viennese waltz, that's uh, a topic being used in a way that's a genre synecdoche. And you get the same thing in Golem II, the Bionic Vapor Boy, where just the keyboard line stands in for 70s funk and so on. Yeah. What other aspects of combination do you hear here? Seamus writes, I found right, a timbral blurring. Oh, I you can just- out loud, out loud. I was just writing it since I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, but yeah, I found the tambular blurring interesting. Like I wasn't sure if I was listening to the futuristic synths or the funk clavinet, it auto-connected to clarinet, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, but that mix just worked really well. And it was sort of going back and forth between those two very different coded timbres. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And of course, hearing this from a 
2020 perspective, retro futurist synths and funk clavinet are part of the same genre, which is future funk. Uh, but future funk didn't exist in, uh, in 1999. Maybe this was an antecedent to it. I don't know. Uh, and that's a thing. Yeah, uh, it's a real issue is that now that it's so common for genres to be combined, things no longer have a single genre association. They have a whole cluster of genre associations. One thing that this track does have in common with Schnitka though, is the use of recurring motifs in different styles. Uh, so at the beginning, you know, you've got this motif, yeah, da, 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 and uh, Leyden points out that that initially occurs in music box mode and then carnival mode and then bubblegum mode and then retro futuristic mode. So let's just listen to the opening again and hear that. So there's the music box, which falls under antique mechanical. And there's carnival, which also falls under antique mechanical, according to bubblegum. So there it is. That's a, uh, a retro futuristic version of it. Uh, so that creates a lot of continuity between the different styles, as well as the backbeat and the timbre and the studio production. Uh, in a way that's technically very similar to what Schnitka did with yeah da da da, but uh, smoother and made smoother by all those other factors that we talked about. Timbre is glue. I love that. Uh, Seamus wrote that in the chat. Julian says it seems like timbre specifically is perhaps the most important element here. I took an entire seminar on timbre once, and so I think about it a bunch. And yeah, timbre is a huge part of what uh, points to particular genres. Uh, and you can get very different polystylistic effects depending on whether you distort timbre or maintain it. So Schnitke distorts the tango timbre by assigning the uh, guitar part or keyboard part to a harpsichord. Whereas Zorn generally keeps timbres the same. If it's, you know, if it's bebop, it's a sax solo. Um, and Mr. Bungle does a combination of the two along with bleepy sounds that don't necessarily have as strong associations. Um, Although Leiden also connects those to the uh, retrofuturistic trope. Here's something else I would point out. When Leiden talks about the topics in this track, there's a lot of decade names, 60s, 70s, 80s. The song is from 1999. So everything is pointing in some way to a moment in history. That was not so true with classical topic theory. By the end of the 19th century, it starts to be. But if you look at Mozart, those hunting calls were contemporary hunting calls. Sturm und Drang was a contemporary literary movement. Uh, dances like the Minuet were still being done, I think. Um, mechanical clockwork style was a reference to technology that was current. The learned counterpoint thing was pointing back at the Baroque to a degree. But other than that, they were the sounds of the world around us that were contempt world rather the world around the people who would be listening to the music. Um, as Alan Brooks said, as I quoted, gestures that vibrated in a familiar fashion in people's ears and pulses. But now there are different things in our ears and what's in our ears, thanks to recording technology, covers a lot more historical ground. And Leyden suggests this. Is this difference perhaps the result of the recording industry having given people a degree of music historical awareness that few people had in the 18th century? Which brings me to my final question to you before you can ask me questions, which is when you listen to this music and also when you listen to other music, do you find yourself listening in a historical way? Are you thinking of uh, you know, the eras that are being alluded to, past eras uh, in the music you're listening to?
or Christina adds that Lysis uh, stated explicitly that their sound environment would be heard in their music. Absolutely. And that's part of why Poulenc was, you know, a, such a significant antecedent. You can talk about uh, Mio as well, referencing uh, jazz and, and Brazilian traditional music and so on. Yeah. I was going to mention this earlier with the Zorn piece. I actually had a really hard time hearing it as genuine because as a modern listener, I've only really experienced that film noir style as a parody. And I've mm. never really experienced it as its own, as its own genre. So I, I myself, whenever I see film noir, experience it as a parody. So hearing that, I was like, oh, this is sarcastic. This is jaded. But of course, in that era, I, it, it wouldn't have been. It, it, taking that genre seriously wouldn't have been as yeah, well, there's sort of a complicated historical layering to that, too, because film noir as an actual genre died out around the, the very early 60s. Sometimes people say Blast of Silence from 1961 was the last true noir film. And a lot of the tropes that we associate with noir are not from or the original set of noir films, but from neo-noir in the 70s. Uh, for example, the idea of the detective walking around to melancholy jazz, that didn't exist in, in classic Hollywood film noir. They had orchestral scores, except for Touch of Evil, which has no, which has only diegetic music. Uh, but generally speaking, they had orchestral scores, sort of post-Wagnerian tumultuousness. The melancholy sax or trumpet, that's from Taxi Driver. That's from Chinatown. That's from 70s New Hollywood directors referencing film noir and recreating it in generally a much more violent, cynical, and, and, uh, and, and, What's the word I'm looking for? Jaded, like you said, way, uh, and in color. Uh, the Long Goodbye is a great example of that. Robert Altman's adaptation from the 70s of a 1950s crime novel by Raymond Chandler. And in a way, the, the um, how do I want to put this? The original character of Philip Marlowe from Chandler's novels is more accurately represented in the 1970s neo-noir version than in actual film noir. Because in actual film noir, Marlowe is a badass. You know, Humphrey Bogart plays him in The Big Sleep. He's slick and he's on top of things. Marlowe in the novels is kind of a sad sack who solves mysteries by accident. And that's very much the Marlowe of the 1970s uh, Long Goodbye film, which also has sad jazz music in it. And then again, this album is from the 80s, at which point even that would have been kind of retro and had started being parodied. So there's this kind of ever receding original that you can never quite get to. Uh, Seamus writes, are decade memes necessarily about the past or are they our contemporary experience of those stylistic ideas? Like, I don't think of funk clavinet and organ as something that is only used in a retro context. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, if you look, like there's nothing as 80s in the actual 80s as some of the neo 80s stuff that exists now. Like if you look at like the aesthetics of synth wave and vapor wave, that, that didn't exist. It wasn't a thing, you know. Uh, it's combining the most iconic 80s things from a million different places. You know, neon signs, computer graphics, uh, the scores of uh, infomercials and so on and putting them all in the same place to make this kind of distilled essence of 80s-ness. I feel like, like that kind of goes yeah. back to, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like that kind of goes back a little bit to our discussion of like abstraction because that definitely is like very much an abstraction of the reality of a, of a historical moment like thrown forward into the future to the present and like distilled in order to make something that we want to say is authentic but like can't be. Yeah. Maybe it's, uh, you know, real genuine Corelli made in the USSR or another description from Schnitka. Uh, I think it was my great grandmother's favorite tango, which her grandmother used to play for her on the harpsichord. That's not a real memory. That's an invented memory. <laughs> so this raises the question of whether polystylism in an era of historical awareness and polystylism is essentially a phenomenon of historical awareness. Uh, phenomenon made possible, as we talked about at the beginning, by a greater access to music from other cultures and other parts of history, 
maybe it's not just referencing the past. Maybe it's referencing our idealized echoes of the past, which themselves were referencing their own past and so on. And something I wrote about this actually, which I wanna see if I can dig up. Uh, um, one moment. Yes, here we go. So um, Isaac Shankler wrote an article about uh, Daft Punk's album, Random Access Memories, the one that uh, Lucky comes from. Is it called Lucky or Get Lucky? Anyway, um, they wrote, there's also a palpable strain of melancholy that runs through the album. Something that suggests this kind of nostalgia may be more sinister than it first appears. And my response to that was the following. A lot of the music of the early 80s, which is, you know, the Daft Punk album is referring back to the early 80s. I said, a lot of the music of the early 80s itself has a palpable strain of melancholy running through it. Just listen to Thomas Dolby's achingly lonely first album, The Golden Age of Wireless, whose title is itself nostalgic for an earlier era, the 50s and 60s, when Vladimir Ustachevsky wrote Wireless Fantasy a piece that looks back nostalgically to an early 20th century radio broadcast of the prelude from Parsifal. And of course, Parsifal takes place in an imaginary past that already sees itself as corrupted and fallen in comparison to some impossibly distant, inaccessible golden age. And Lara asks in the chat, at that point, is it even about the past? Well, that's a very good question. Is it? What do you think? Mr. Bungle is a great, al a great example of this because this album, California, in particular, is their tribute to the kind of cheesy but lovable, or maybe cheesy and therefore lovable pop culture of the 50s and 60s, California culture. The album references surf rock. There's some Beach Boys kind of stuff. Uh, there's swing in there. There's sounds of seagulls. A lot of major seventh chords, some kind of pseudo bossa nova stuff, as well as also references to metal and and uh, Balinese kachak and uh, po polkas and and so on. Hey, I think uh, something that might be uh, the development now is re rather than referring to styles in a specific context sort of way, it's now an adapting of styles. Um, and I, I feel like that's the difference between classical composers in Shinnika's time doing polystylism and classical composers now, is now it's not like I'm going to reference this thing and that's the point. Now it's um, I'm going to use this thing as a compositional tool. Um, and obviously in our political culture now, we prefer to do it in an educated way. Uh, and that's the hard part. But I, I think the intention is different now. Yeah. So you think that maybe it's a less self-conscious process? Um, the result is less self-conscious. I don't know if the process is less self-conscious. Does that make mm. sense? <laughs> yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah. Uh, and that, yeah. And that raises the question again of, you know, if you listen to a contemporary piece that draws as draws on some element of, I don't know, let's say tango as a compositional tool, are you still thinking about tangos when you hear it? Or are you, are you maybe kind of thinking about tangos, but in not as much of an emphasized way as when you listen to the Schnitke Concerto Grosso movement? That's a good question. I, I think like it's hard to make a blanket answer because it's so case by case. There's like a spectrum of, um, well, as you said, self-consciousness where like Schnick is extremely self-conscious, but a different uh, composer might adapt the tango in a different way. For sure, yeah. And then you get, on the other hand, composers like Astor Piazzolla, who grew up in tango culture. And rather than incorporating tango into new music, they're incorporating new music into tango, um, as well as jazz, uh, uh, which is a very different vibe. I remember getting into a dispute uh, with a composer many years ago who said that uh, new music composers who incorporate rock music are being colonialist because they think that rock music isn't good enough by itself and it needs to be improved. And I remember thinking, no, in my mind, it's the opposite. Classical music needs to be improved. <laughs> Amen. <You know? laughs> Classical music for most of its history was open to pop culture. And then 
there was a period when not everybody felt this way, but there was a period, especially in academia, where that was forbidden and seen as vulgar and banal, if you want to talk like Schnitke about it. And so now, you know, composers have grown up with pop culture in our ears and we respect it and we care about it rather than disdaining it as, you know, uh, as somebody once said to me, uh, mass market cliches designed to, to uh, make the most money possible. Um, yeah, there's a lot of creativity and innovation in pop culture that we can learn from so that our music isn't this completely isolated, disconnected thing. All right, so we've got a lot of questions here in the comments. Seamus says, is compositional tool an objectification? Tell me more about what you mean by that. I mean, it's sort of um, when in the conversation after I had typed that, when we were more going in the direction of like people coming from both classical music and another musical culture and incorporating those two, I'm less thinking of that. But when, when we were talking about like, <clears throat> using tango as a compositional tool. And I, I think you asked Alex, if you're using tango as a compositional tool, are you still thinking about it as tango? So I'm thinking of it in that sense as you sort of, there's the, um, there's the risk of slipping into this more objectivist mindset where all, where other musical cultures besides quote unquote Western art music are like open for usage to convey your ideas in like a pseudo objective way. That's what I think. Yeah, no, I think that is definitely a risk. And I think that goes back to um, Schaeffer's modes of listening, where if you take something that has a significant cultural significance in its particular context and you approach it through reduced listening rather than through uh, semantic listening, then you strip it of its cultural context. And there's value for sure in you know listening to say, Balinese gamelan music and hearing it as sound, but that's also music that's embedded within Indonesian society and it's connected to religious ritual and it's something that people grow up with. Uh, and so you can't reduce it to mere sound without missing a huge amount of what it is. Uh, that's another sort of cultural pathology of classical music culture is the notion that sound is sound and that's that. And of course, I don't think anybody in this room believes that, but I've definitely met people, particularly for particularly European composers who take that approach. Um, and it's very troubling to me because ignoring social context doesn't make it go away. It just means you're not seeing it. Okay, so Dale says, I feel like the process would be less self-conscious now because it's more likely that composers in this day and age would have more likely have an authentic connection to a variety of styles. Like maybe somebody's writing a classical piece that utilizes like a backbeat because they love both rock and classical music and have a connection to both. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something we have to be careful about for sure. But I think in general, that is much more the case with uh, you know composers born after let's say 1970 uh, or even 1960 than the previous generation. Um, when you have composers born in the forties and fifties incorporating rock music, it often feels like there's a, to me, this is very subjective too, but it often feels like, all right, so we're gonna take this outside thing now and put it in here uh, rather than a, a merging. Um, Lily says, uh, uh, kind of about self-consciousness. There were a couple of mentions of parody in this talk as something sarcastic or cynically degrading the original work. The best parodies and satires are ones created by people who have a deep love and or appreciation of the original work. Anyone can take a dig at the thing but only people who know the thing well can make it a quality dig. This kind of contrasts with how we are basically defining the past in a way that is inauthentic to what that time might've been like, but is authentic to our sense of nostalgia and appreciation for an idealized not now. Yeah, I think that's very insightful. Thank you, Lily, who I don't see here. Uh, maybe it's only showing me the video people. Um, yeah, I think that's very much true. And that to me is, that's part of why I, like Zorn more than I like Schnitke, as fascinating as I find Schnitke historically, um, precisely because it doesn't seem like he really fully appreciates the tango or the Baroque music that he's referencing. And I think I like Schnitke best when he's not as focused on polystylism. Uh, if you look at a piece like his piano quintet, it's more just a kind of post Mollerian, post Shostakovichian uh, spookiness. It, ref it, it changes harmonic languages a lot, but it isn't quite so intentionally referential. Um, I grew up on the work of Frank Zappa, who for all his problems, including 
a very blatant misogyny, um, did some wonderfully fascinating things with style and parody. And his parodies are always loving ones. Uh, when he references doo-wop, even though it's exaggerated and silly, you know he loves that music. And he's talked about how he loves that music. It's very much a part of him. Uh, so I think that's a great point. Dale says, I've heard that the contrast between parody and satire is that parody is critique made of love and satire is made with the intent of attacking or addressing that the satirist seems problematic or wrong. I don't know, food for thought. Yeah, I'm not sure about that distinction, but it sounds plausible to me. Uh, Christina says, coloniality, absolutely. Similar to orientalizing, orientalism, the fetishizing of the past, the imagined past. Yeah, one of my favorite passages from the introduction to Edward Said's book, Orientalism, is... Let's see if I remember this right. It seems to be a common human failing to prefer the schematic authority of a text to the direct to the disorientation of direct encounters with the human. And you can talk about that with respect to this music, absolutely. And why there's a huge difference between, uh, you know, referencing something that you've kind of picked up through other people's representations of it can versus just, referencing something. What'd you say? Can I jump in on that thought for one second? Please, yeah. Um, those are sort of two thoughts that came uh, in response to two different comments, but they do jive nicely. The one about the Orientalism and coloniality, obviously not one without mm. the other. Um, I just want to go a little further because it's so interesting to me and I'd love every musician to think about it with me in life. But uh, it, in my grad studies, I did some querying of this trope that, you know, music from tribal people or, um, you know, um, we'll just put it that way, music from tribal, uh, societies is functional, whereas, of course, classical music, absolute music, you know, has no function, right? So I'm talking about the coloniality of that, but I, um, through the anthropological lens uh, I used for my studies, you know, people in society do something because it somehow functions to recreate that society. We wouldn't be making symphonies if they didn't have a function. So I was querying, you know, what is that function? And I finally arrived at at least one answer, which is that uh, insisting on this experience of classical Western music as abstracted from meaning uh, helps fulfill the function of, of separating, and you alluded to it later, the mind-body separation, like mm -hmm. removing our ability to be compassionate in our bodies, which you, 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 ha you have to achieve that split before you can like colonize entire peoples and hold, you know, keep slaves in your house or whatever. That, that was my, that's what I posited. I just want to throw that out there. I'd love to. I think that's that. a, I think it's a function and it depends on, you know, the specific a musicians and the audiences and a lot of other factors. Yeah. Uh, Foucault might say it's, it's a, a way of disciplining the body. Um, I think there also is such a thing as, as non-functional pleasure in all societies. Um, oh, I think pleasure is know. functional. I mean, yeah, course, pleasure is functional. That's another way we, to put it. We, yeah. won't assign, we won't assign a value or a function to simply the experience of pleasuring ourselves sensually, which of course, you know, any symphony that I love can do. I just think we're not as honest about. Yeah. And there's, and the idea that, you know, if you look at, you know, music that's used in a religious ritual in a non-Western culture to say, oh, that's just functional. I mean, the B minor mass was written for a religious ritual. You know, that's such a reductive way of looking at things. Things can be functional and beautiful at the same time and often are. Uh, the same thing, I mean, the entire history of Western classical music and European painting comes out of the church. Thought on that is usually, so often these days when you have a commission there is some sort of thing that it is being commissioned for. So that is a specific function, isn't it? Yeah, and that's been true for, you know, you know for centuries in, in classical music, you know, uh, overtures to plays and pieces uh, celebrating somebody's victory in a war. And, you know, it's very striking to me, the word genre, we now use it to mean something like style that definition is a product of the recording industry it made to separate things out in record stores so you can sell more products. Genre used to mean what was the function? Is it for the church? Is it for the salon? Is it for the concert hall? Uh, and so on. And that's a very, <laughs> the genders of music. Yeah, I have referred to my music as genre queer in the past. Uh, 
Um, Julian says, it's nice how we can read love into music making. More relevantly, it's true that sometimes styles slash parodies seem like props more than loved or respected elements. Yeah, uh, it's all very complicated, these issues of, um, you know, what, how does your music function with respect to existing hierarchies? Does it reinforce them or does it undermine them? And often the particular musical characteristics that lead to different answers to that question are very subtle. Uh, and as we talked about at the beginning, they're also subjective. And, you know, two people might hear Schnitka very differently. Two people might also hear Mr. Bungle very differently and do all the time. One of the weirder things about this album, California, is that hardcore Mr. Bungle fans who were more into their earlier, more noisy and metally kind of stuff, some of them thought that this was selling out, this weird sort of like mashed up incinerated pop music, which is a very strange thing when you think about what was actually top 40 music in 1999. This is not exactly sound like, uh, you know, Christina Aguilera. Of course, the whole concept of selling out is fraught and built upon various elements of capitalism and authenticity culture and, and that's a whole other discussion and we're <laughs> running pretty late, I guess, uh, or not running pretty late, but getting close to our time. So other questions? I have a quick comment. Um, yeah. I, I've been, this is a, you, you made a quote um, or you referenced a quote a while ago um, and forgive me if I've misinterpreted it, but it seemed like um, it was saying that this sort of pointing towards an earlier genre or indicating an earlier style um, was more of a new phenomenon or a post-1900 phenomenon. Um, and I, I kind of take issue with that because I, I feel like that was definitely something that was done earlier in Western music. But now we sort of, you know, we, we look back and we say the classical era lasted from this time to this time. So if somebody was, if you know, when Mozart references something that was popular 10 years ago, we don't see it that way. We see it as classical music referencing classical music or Baroque music referencing Baroque music. Um, so I wonder if, you know, in a hundred years, they're not going to say, oh, this is pointing towards the 60s. This is pointing towards the 70s. They're going to say this was postmodern rockabilly, you know, whatever they've deemed it. And um, they're going to say it's, it's all self-referencing because it's, they won't see those differentiations like we do. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And something I've thought about with respect to um, Schubert's Erlkönig is that the, the music that the Erlkönig sings to, uh, to seduce the boy to come to his realm is retro. It sounds like, like 18th century music, you know. Du liebes Kind, komm geh. Oh, it's actually not so much that one as the next one. So absolutely, that's true. Uh, and that's a very good point. At the same time, there's now an entire culture industry of uh, defining decades as objects of consumption in a way that there really wasn't back then. There were trends, certainly, you know, people uh, of Bach's kids' generation thought that fugues were too fussy and, and old fashioned, uh, for example. Um, and uh, especially in the 19th century, you get, you know, people like Liszt and Wagner saying, you know, we're the music of the future. And anybody who's still writing pieces in sonata form is obsolete, looking at you, Johannes, you know, that's a thing for sure. Um, but it wasn't as systematized or as totalizing or as frequent as it has become since the, especially the mid 20th century. Um, Julian points out the soldier's tale. Uh, yeah, Stravinsky absolutely um, has sort of proto polystylistic elements at times. Uh, and, and very much so with Ives as well. And Ives is a fascinating example because he was really not into stylistic hierarchies. His love for, you know, Americana and folk music is, and, and you know, the kind of post Stephen Foster, let's not think too hard about the cultural context of Stephen Foster maybe, or let's actually, uh, kind of uh, Americana, that was all very dear to him. Anyone else? All right, I guess we've landed a point of arrival. Oh yeah? Can you talk a little bit about your music? Yes, okay. 
my elevator pitch. Um, has anybody been to New Music Gathering? So New Music Gathering has a thing called New Music Speed Dating, where you have uh, five minutes to talk to, if you're a performer, to talk to a composer or vice versa about a potential collaboration. And then, well, when they were doing it in person, I, mean, I don't know how they did it. I didn't go to the virtual one this year, but they ba literally banged a gong and you moved over to the next person. And my elevator pitch was that I'm interested in uh, narrative, surrealism, postmodernism, polystylism, uh, queerness, cheesiness, shininess, and major seventh chords. So, um, so you can break out rooms in Zoom, that makes sense. Um, so here's my website, which I'll type in there. You can hear a bunch of my music. Uh, if you're interested in the real sharp juxtaposition kind of polystylism, I would check out my piece, um, The Man Who Hated Everything, which is my tribute to and also critique of Frank Zappa. Um, there are other pieces where um, there's usually some intentional genre referentiality, um, you know, in this kind of genre synecdoche sense of elements of particular styles carrying cultural connotations. That's a thing I'm very interested in. And it's more present in some of my music than others. Um, or you can click on Tiny Bun and Tiny Kitten and hear a really adorable theme song to a non-existent cartoon show. In fact, I'll share that with you right now. Since it's only 15 seconds long. Tiny bun and tiny kitten, the best of friends, the cutest of friends. Like I said, shininess and major seventh chords. And with that, I think that's a perfect uh, time to take down the live stream. Thank okay. you so much, Alex. This has been wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, you've had wonderful questions and comments. Very thought provoking. Just gonna let it run for a second more so that they get the entire